Praise the Lord, everybody. All of my help cometh from the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's, it was, it's been six months since I've heard them play together. So I wanted them to play a little longer. Amen. Amen. I wanted them to, needed to hear that. Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory for the great things that he has done, is doing, and what he will do. Amen. Our scripture today is coming from a book that is not really discussed as much and it's not really preached from as much. And it's a book that if you're going too fast, you will walk, you will go right by it. Amen. Third John in the New Testament. Third John in the New Testament and it's right before Revelations. But Third John in the New Testament is where our scripture is coming from on today. And it reads, thusly, we're going to 3 John verses 9 through 10. Amen. And that's it. It's not one chapter, two chapter, three chapters. That's it. 3 John verses 9 through 10. And it's um, written uh, by John, the apostle. And this is the word he says. He said, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephus, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Puts them out of the church. He doesn't welcome other believers. He also stopped those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. And just for a few moments, we're going to speak from the subject, the disastrous disease of I. The disastrous disease of I. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we come. We thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for your blessing, God. We thank you for a wonderful time up until this point. We thank you for the prayers that was prayed. We thank you, God, for the songs that was sung. We thank you, God, for the musical instruments that was played. God, and now the word. God, and now we're, the word will go forth, God, and we pray that they go forth on open hearts to receive what you have set forth for this place for such a time as this. God, help us. Help us to remove ourselves from this dreaded disease called I. Help us to remove ourselves, understanding that in the kingdom is not about us, but is about the whole and is about lifting up and glorifying God. So we thank you, God, Abase Bernard, and bless and Abase Bernard and exalt the Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. The dreaded disease, the disastrous disease. <clears throat> of I. According to the World Health Organization, a disease is defined as a condition which threatens a human state of health, causing problems such as pain, distress, dysfunctions, social problems, and death. In fact, diseases include a large part of all causes of death worldwide. The WHO says chronic diseases are the leading cause of death worldwide. And according to the Center for Disease Control, the following are the top 10 causes of death within the United States in the year 2018. The first one is heart disease, responsible for 655,381 deaths in 2018 which comes out to 23.1% of the deaths in the United States. Cancer, 599,274 deaths, representing 21.1% of deaths in the United States. Accidents or unintentional injuries, 167,127 deaths, representing 5.9% of the deaths, and this include car accidents, falls, and drug overdoses. Number four, chronic lower respiratory diseases. 159,486 deaths 
representing 5.6%. Included in this category are chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, asthma, occupational lung disease, and hypertension. The fifth one. Cerebrovascular diseases, 147,810 deaths, 5.2%. Included in this category are strokes, corroded stenosis, aneurysms, and vascular malfun malformations. Number six, Alzheimer's disease, 122,019, representing 4.3%. Number seven, diabetes. 84,946 deaths, representing 3% of the total deaths in 2018 in the United States. Number eight, influenza and pneumonia. 59,120 deaths, representing 2.1% of the total deaths in the United States. Number nine, kidney disease. 51,386 deaths, representing 1.8% of the total deaths in the United States. And then finally, number 10, Suicide, 48,344 deaths, representing 1.7% of the death, total deaths in the United States in 2018. Diseases are a strong force to reckon with. And without the proper care and possible medication, the results can be deadly. But just as it is with the physical, emotional, and medical diseases, there are some spiritual diseases that need to be cared for or confronted in the church on today. And today we will focus on one of the main diseases that's causing problems in the churches and in the kingdom of God on today. The disease of I. This self-proclaimed, self-important person. The disease of I. The it's all about me person. The all about everything has to be about me. We know them. I know them. You know them. We all know them. And I pray that none of us are them. We find a great example in the New Testament. In a book, not too much attention is paid to. In the third in, in third John, we find a brother named Diotrephus. Diotrephus. We must understand that without an I, you can't have the word sin. Without the word I, you can't have the word sin. And embedded in sin is self. The whole purpose of sin is the elevation of self. When you go against the principles of God, and God's principle is not about us, it's about all of us. It's not about one person. Jesus just didn't die on the cross for Bernard. He didn't just die on the cross for Suzanne. He died on the cross for everybody. Jesus' life and ministry was about the edification of others and not him. For the Christian, for the kingdom worshiper, for the kingdom resident, humble is the way that we must go. We cannot fall into this dreaded, this, this that disastrous disease of I. John doesn't write much about this man named Diotrephus, but what he does write isn't very flattering, and rightly so. It appears that this man is a man that John fully intends on confronting if he ever returns to the church that he is referring to. And looking at this man, Diotrephus, today I believe that we will uncover four characteristics that can cause problems in the Christian church on today. If these characteristics, if these diseases go unrecognized, if they go unchallenged, if they go unfixed, they can quickly lead to what could be diagnosed as a Diotrephus disease, the disease of I. The first characteristic we see about this brother is that he loves to be first. Look at verse number nine. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephus, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. He loves to be first. He loves to be up front. 
He loves to be the main cog in everything. He loves to be the main person. And how does this desire, how does this disease, this characteristic, show his, itself? Have you ever seen the actions and the reactions, the behaviors and the attitudes of someone who loves to be first? Such people are usually filled with pride. Such people are usually filled with themselves, thinking that if I don't do it, it cannot get done. If I'm not involved, the program will not be a success. If I don't lead a song, nobody will feel the spirit because I'm the only one that can hit the note that Sherma plays. That dreaded disease of wanting to be first. This is the kind of person that is not easily humbled. A true Christian will always be humble. A true Christian will not be the one that want to be up front. Because remember what Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. It's not about us. It's not about me being on every program. You want to be the head of the missionary board. You want to be head of the deaconess. I ain't even a deaconess, but want to be the head of it. You want to be the head of the choir. You want to be the head of the usher. You want to always be first. That's the first characteristic we see in, with this brother. These people have to have the best seats. Matter of fact, when they're in the car, they have to be in the front seat. They like to have their name prominent, prominently mentioned whenever and wherever possible. Reverend Dufont came to me <coughs> um, a couple of weeks ago and said, and I don't know if the person is here, if they're here, it is what it is, but um, she said, don't mention my name when you talk about the evangelism and outreach ministry. And, I said, and she knew my next question was going to be why. You are the ministry lead. Whenever I talk about the ministry, you should be the one. And she said, listen, just, just don't. You just don't. So let me put it for right up in front here in Mount Zion. If she's the lead and things are happening, I'm not going to mention every single person. I will mention the lead and then everybody else. We got to get out of our, we got to get out of the way and stop thinking that if my name ain't mentioned, I'm going to get an attitude. That's not the way of the Christian. She's the lead. Don't mean she's doing all the work, but she's the lead. Amen? And so she should be mentioned, but that was her humbleness talking. So she's not suffering from this dreaded disease. I don't believe she is. Of I. I don't think she is. Amen? Not from what I've seen. But this brother wants to be first. He wants to be first in everything. He wants his name mentioned. He wants his name mentioned on the screen. He wants Raheem to put his name on the screen, even if he ain't doing nothing. Just put my name up there. I need to see my name in lights. We know some people like that. We all know some people like that. But my prayer is that nobody here, nobody on the conference call line or that's viewing it are the people that we know. But we know that some people always want to be first. They have to have the jobs that get tons of recognition. But if you ask them to pick up trash off the floor, they will say that's for somebody else. I need to be, give me a job, pastor, that people are going to see me. Give me a job so I can come in late and have the ushers usher me right to the front seat so I can sit right behind Sherma as she's playing. I know people will see me because they'll be focused on the music. So I'll come in late every single Sunday, same time. And I want the same usher to lead me up. I want Sister Spray to bring me up the aisle so people can see me every single Sunday. That dreaded disease of wanting to be first. And these are the people that always want to have the last word. No matter what, you could be talking about sickness, whatever. They must have the last word. They must be the last voice heard in everything. That dreaded disease of wanting to be first. And why do you think people want to be first? Maybe they just lack so much in their life that they're looking for something. 
There's something that they want recognition for on and on and on and on again. Something is lacking in their life. Maybe it's because they're afraid of being last. Maybe they're afraid of being left out or being left behind. Or just maybe they crave attention. That their whole being is because they need attention. No matter what they need. When they go to the supermarket, they need attention. When they go to the jobs, they need attention. Wherever they go, they need attention. Maybe it's because they want to hide some weaknesses that they have. There are some people that want to be first because they feel that it will hide something that they're going through. It would hide a weakness that they have, that it will hide something. If I'm always up front, I don't have to deal with my struggles. If I'm always doing something, if I'm always being called up front, I don't have to deal with the fact that my house is full of hell. When I come to church, I raise hell in church and I cause all the problems in church because I don't want to deal with the relations in my personal life. I'll do all that I can. I'll make sure I start trouble in the church because I have a problem at home that I would rather deal with problems in the church than to deal with what's going on at home. I need to be first. I need to be up front because they don't pay attention to me at home. They don't pay attention to me on the job. They don't pay attention to me in the city square. They don't pay attention to me in the supermarket. But when I come to church, I can be first. I can be forefront. I can have everybody say nice things about me. I don't get that at home. My spouse don't say nothing good about me. My children don't say nothing good about me. But the church... Is supposed to love me. The church is supposed to follow Jesus. And so I could do everything I don't get at home. I could get at the church. I just need that recognition. I need to be first. And it doesn't matter how many times your name is mentioned. It doesn't matter how many times you are first on the road. If you don't deal with what's going on in your life, that's all superficial. If you don't deal with the problems at home, don't think your problems will be resolved in the church house. If you don't deal with the hell at home, don't bring hell here. This is not the place for you to work out your issues at home. And you come here and you fall and you roll on the floor. And they put the sheet over you and everything as soon as you go home. All hell breaks loose. You still have to deal with your problems even for the time you spend here at the church. The question becomes, is it possible for Christians to have this type of attitude? Is it possible for kingdom citizens to have this type of attitude? As we study this kingdom curriculum, as we go forth understanding what the word of God is saying about the kingdom of God. As we study what Jesus said about the kingdom, can a true Christian have this attitude of always wanting to be first? Is that the attitude of the Christian? Should we always want to be first? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Christians never should have this attitude, so we think. After all, wasn't it Jesus who said that the last shall be first and the first shall be last? I'm going to do everything I can to be last so that I'll be first. You need to understand why Jesus said that. If you don't really read the word, you don't get into when Jesus said the last shall be first and the first shall be last. He wasn't talking about position. He wasn't talking about you being first in line. He wasn't talking about you being the first one to have your name called. He was talking about in a position of humbleness because the humble person won't want to be first. The humble person won't want to be the ones always in front. Jesus saying for who society feels are the least important and the kingdom of God is the most important. 
We need to understand the last shall be first and the first is not talking about your position in line. It's not talking about that when the motor vehicles opened up after the pandemic, people were getting in line at two and three o'clock in the morning because the lines were so long. I guarantee you nobody was saying up there that the first shall be last. Not then. Not then, because it was not the same thing that Jesus is talking about. In the kingdom of God, the one that want to be the most important, Jesus is saying you need to take a step back. You need to take a step back because that's not where I'm looking. The first one, oh, you better be careful that you want to be first. Because in some things, want to be first, you bring more damnation to yourself. You bring more damnation to yourself. We got to be very, very careful. One of the major themes of Jesus' ministry was the principle of servant leadership during this pandemic with the deacons, with the ministers, deaconess, trustees, and now we will go for, um, larger to the leadership ministry. I discuss servant leadership based on how Jesus led. Jesus led, not always by what he says, but what he did. Amen. Your leadership must be part of being humble. Your leadership must be part of being a servant to the most high God. In the kingdom of God, we don't lead by position. You got some pastors that are not truly the leaders of their church because they're not servant leaders. You have some people who believe that everybody ought to be serving them and not serving the most high, God. That's not serving leadership. In serving leadership, humbleness leads the way. In serving leadership, people lead, see you leading by what you do. And so that's why I was bothered when Dufont came to me. You didn't tell me. I have to tell you. <laughs> when she said, don't say my name, that bothered me. Because she's a servant leader. And I won't say people's name just to puff them up. That's not why I call names. I don't call names just so they can pat themselves on the back. I will call your name when you're doing what you're supposed to do. In servant leadership. And so we all, everyone, you don't even have to have a title in the kingdom of God. To be a servant leader. You don't have to be the president of the right now club to be a servant leader. Nooney don't ever want, I don't ever have to say his name, but we see him leading when he plays that organ. We don't ever have to call Sherman's name. We don't ever have to call DeMond's name, but we see them leading. They're not doing this to be puffed up because if they are, they don't need to be here. We are doing what we do because God told us to do it. And if you don't do what God says to do, it don't matter who calls your name. You've got hell to pay. You must be in, in the kingdom of God. We cannot have leaders who's leading because they want something. We're following Jesus. We're following his behavior. We're following what he did. And Jesus did not want to be in front. Jesus led as a servant. He said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. That's the mantra we must have as kingdom of God citizens. We don't come to be served, but to come to serve. And that's what was happening yesterday. We didn't come for people to serve us but we came to serve somebody else. We've got to understand that once we get out of this disease of I, we can see what God wants us to do. When we get out of this disease of I, we're able to move forward in the work of the kingdom. So many churches and houses of faith are stunted in their growth because everybody wants to be the I. Everybody wants to be up front. Why are you doing that? I don't know. Why are you doing why are you here? I don't know. 
Why are you sitting in the front? I don't know. Seat was empty, I came. Nobody's going to call your name, they tip out. We've got to stop wanting to be the one in front. I would rather be in the back all the time. Amen. Because, see, in the back, I told you about when I used, we used to get beatings in my house. I was the last one. I could always see the effect of my father hitting everybody else. I could see, and I could always see when he's getting tired. And so I know when it came to me, if I talk to him a little bit more, he'll get more and more tired. It really didn't work It didn't that way, but, you know, to God be the glory. <clears throat> being in the back and being last, there are advantages because you get to see some things that's happening in front of you. When you're the first one, you get the first licking. When you're the first one, you get the first whooping. You can't always think that it's going to be positive by being first. Sometimes, especially in the kingdom of God, being last, being last is a blessing. I followed Jesus first. We remember in the, in the Bible when the mother um, of John, the, what was it, Zebedee, she wanted her sons to be first. She said, who's going to sit? up with you. And Jesus basically told her, there's a cost to sit high. And I don't think your sons is going to want to engage in that cost, but there's a cost. Everybody wants to be first, but nobody wants to pay the price. There is a price for being first. There is a price for sitting high. Listen, anybody wants to be the pastor, come do it. This is not something that I, I wanted to do. This is something that God called me to do. There's a cost for sitting high. There's a cost. There's a price to be paid for sitting high. Be careful what you ask for. Because if you get it and you can't handle it, hell on you and everybody connected to you. There is a cost with this dreaded disease of high. Jesus reinforced when the, remember when the disciples was having an argument on who shall be first. And they thought Jesus didn't hear them. And Jesus says, what is it that you're arguing about? And they got quiet. They got quiet. And Jesus let them know, is it because you probably, they knew that Jesus, what Jesus was going to say to them. If they told Jesus what they were arguing about. If they told him that Jesus, they told Jesus, we want to know who's going to be first in your kingdom with you. They knew that they would be rebuked by Jesus. We got to be careful. God knows everything we're talking about. He knows everything we're thinking about. So anytime you're thinking that I need to be higher than I am, God hears it. Anytime you're thinking that I need to be in the first round, if I don't do it, it can't be done. God hears that. Be very, very careful because God, sometimes if he gives you what you want, and you can't handle it, you'll be wishing to be back at being last. So be very, very careful. In, ninth, in Matthew, the 19th chapter, verses 28 to 30, Jesus indicate that at the end times, many who are first will be last, and many who, will be, many who are last will be first. In the 20th chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 16, Jesus used the parable of the workers in the vineyard to teach this same principle. And then he reemphasized in Mark 10, 25 to 31, and then once again in Luke 13, 22 through 30. So if wanting to be first is as undesirable, that's a blessing. But if it's desirable to be first, you have that spirit of diotrophus. You have that dreaded disease of I that only God can handle. You, there's no medicine for this disease. Nothing you can take. There's no Tylenol. No ibuprofen for this disease. The only way you can get out of this disease is go to God. God is the only way that can take that eye disease from you. And we're not talking about the eye. We're talking about the letter I. We're talking about wanting to be first. And sometimes we can't handle being first. Diotrophus categorized what kind of attitude should we have. Or he characterized what kind of attitude we should not have. Look at Verse number three, do nothing out of self-ambition. In Philippians 2, 3, and 4, verse 3 says, do nothing 
out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Verse 4, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. A true child of God will not be concentrated on just me, but we will be concentrated on we. When I can lift up my brother, the kingdom gets stronger. When my brother can lift me up, the kingdom gets stronger. When we lift each other up, when we don't put each other down, when we don't talk about each other, when we uplift each other, the kingdom of God and the church in general becomes stronger. Are you doing anything to develop this kind of attitude that Di Diotrephus had? If so, what are you doing? Do you catch yourself arguing your greatness, either in your mind or with others? A lot of times we're arguing with ourselves or how great we are. Nobody else believes you're that great but you. You are the main character in your own movie. You are the only actor in your own movie. Nobody can do what you do. You are the only one. So we're arguing with ourselves. We want to show our greatness to ourselves. Nobody else believes you are as great as you think. Do you eagerly seek, seek out ways in which you can serve others? If you're thinking about I, 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 the answer is no. Because if you're thinking about yourself, serving others will not be important. But for the child of God, serving others must be at the forefront of why we do what we do. If we serve others just like Jesus did, he did the ultimate service when he died on the cross for each and every one of us. He died on the cross for all of our sins, not just for some, but for all. Do we have that type of attitude? What are you willing to do to serve others? The most important example Jesus also showed on earth of serving others is when he stripped down, put a towel around his waist, and he bent down and he washed his disciples' feet. Understand, washing the disciples' feet was a feat in and of itself. These brothers had dirty, dirty, dirty feet. They were walking in sandals that Nike did not make. They were walking with sandals that Stacey Adams did not make. These sandals that they were walking in when they took off their shoes, the crusty dirt and other stuff that they picked up from the ground was all on the bottom of their feet. But Jesus stripped down and he washed each of the disciples' feet. If we had homeless folks and we lined them in front of the church this morning and I told them to take off your shoes because as Christians, we're going to wash your feet. How many will be in line behind me to wash their feet? How many will be willing to give up themselves to humble yourself to get down and wash the feet of those that is of the least? We look down on them when they ask for money. So we're going to have a problem washing their feet. But in order to show true humility, we've got to humble ourselves and move away from us to serve others. That is the example of true humility. Look at verse 9. Diotrephus would have nothing, John said, to do with us. The us in this passage refers to John and his companions. What's the significant what is significance about this is that John was an apostle of Jesus Christ, one of the leaders of the early Christian church, and certainly a significant player in the shaping and cultivating of new believers in the kingdom of God. However, we find it written that this brother, some said he was a deacon in the church. Some say he was a minister in the church. He was a big man in the church because he put himself up front. We find it written that Diotrephus would have nothing to do with an apostle of Jesus Christ. He would have nothing to do with those who's bringing the message of love. He would have nothing to do with those who's ministering to the needy. For those who's ministering to the sick, he would have nothing to do with those folks. So it makes me wonder, if in God's church he didn't want to deal with the servants of God, who was he dealing with? 
Who did he welcome into God's house if it wasn't for those that were serving God? He didn't want to deal with Abraham Harrison. He didn't want to deal with Sean Bland. He didn't want to deal with Jane Smith. When you came into the church, he put his nose up against you because you were not on the caliber of the people he wanted to deal with. You were just servants of the Most High God. So he didn't want to deal with the servants. So it is written, we find it written that the ultrafits would have nothing to do with John and his companions. It is because of the threat, more than likely, it is because of the threat John and his companions brought to Diotrephus. The only time people will not want to deal with you and will reject you in most situations, especially in a leadership situation, is because of a threat that you pose to what they're doing. If they're doing something underhanded and you come and they see you as a threat, they won't want to have nothing to do with you. They'll start gossiping about you. They'll start wanting to stab you in your back, wanting to undercut you at the knees because you're a threat. You can see something. You know I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do outside of the church. You may call me on it one day and I'm not ready to answer for that. So you're a threat. So I need to do whatever I have to do to undercut your power that God gave you. You're a threat because you know I've been doing something. And God has revealed it to you, to me, that he has revealed it to you. So you have become enemy number one to me. I don't deal with you because you can expose me in front of everybody. I've had them fooled for 45 years. Mm. I've been the head of the usher board for 43 of those 45 years. And I've had them fooled. Mm. I've been the treasurer. Taking money, I've had them fooled. But now the Lord has revealed he sent you. And you can expose what I'm doing. And so you become enemy number one of me. Diotrephus didn't want to have nothing to do with John the Apostle. Think about that. He didn't want to have nothing to do with the man who walked with Jesus. Nothing to do in the church. We're not talking about the street. In the church, he didn't want to deal with the man of God. He didn't want to deal with the woman of God. He'll deal with everybody else but who God sent. And if that's you today, I beg you to ask God for forgiveness. I beg you, if you know you're doing something that you're not supposed to do and you're worried about it being exposed, you better talk to God quick, fast, and in a hurry. Because it's not about him sending Bernard, him sending Karen, him sending Defont. It's going to be the little old lady that comes walking up the side, walking up the middle aisle. It's going to be that little old man that you think is, can't see, that you've been seeing around town, and he's been seeing stuff in you. It's not those ones that you want to make a, as an enemy that God is coming to expose you. God will send people that you don't even pay attention to. That will expose you because you can't be in God's house playing around with God. I'm not going to be a fool to stand up here and try to preach knowing I'm raising hell outside of the church. God will expose. God will expose you don't have to like me. I don't care. But God will expose in your life those things that you're doing. He will, he's doing it all over this world. All you have to do is listen to the news. Church after church has fallen and going in disarray because God is exposing. And he will continue until it's all over. Exposing because you can't come here playing with God. That's right. This is not the place for you to play games. This is not the, this is so far off of anything I've written, but it needs to be said. We have some major diotrophists in the church, and God is about to start to wean you out. God is about to start to exposing stuff. And people 
that's going to make you run to the altar. He's saying, I've had enough. I, get, I allowed a pandemic thinking that some of you will get it right. And he says, six months later, you're still raising the same type of hell that you were raising before the pandemic. He said, it didn't work. He said, so I, I shut down the whole world. Nobody could come to the household of faith. I shut down the whole world. Everybody afraid of the same thing. I shut down the whole world for a matter of time. And you still walk into my house. You still walk into my house thinking it's all about you. You still come in here preaching and singing and praying. Messing around. He said, I'm out to expose. I don't need coronavirus to do the job. He said, what I'm about to do in your life. You're going to wish you had COVID. What I'm about to do in your life, when I expose you, there will be no coming back. I will expose and take you out. You're going to wish you had COVID when I get through with you. He's tired of the church. Plan church. We have people that needs to know about Jesus. They need a, a word of hope, joy, and peace. And they're coming, walking. I have seen people walking by this church house since I've been up here. They're walking by. Didn't see them last week. And don't think that they're, they're just walking by just for the sake of walking by. They're in search of something. They're in search of something. And don't be surprised one day they're going to come in. Because I believe Mount Zion as a whole. We have some diatrophers in Mount Zion. Who are they, Pastor? It may be you. Don't ask who they are. But I believe Mount Zion has been set up by God to be a light in a dark place. I believe Mount Zion has been set up by God to be the place where people can find what they're looking for without judgment, without any type of backstabbing, without people gossiping about them, People are going to come in here that don't look like you. They don't dress like you. They don't smell like you. But they're looking. They're searching. And they don't need diotrophists meeting them at the door. They don't need to be sitting near a diotrophist. They don't need a diotrophist preaching to them, singing to them. But what God is about to do with this place, I believe, He's about to open up the windows of heaven, I believe. And he's about to pour out some blessings on Mount Zion because we have shown ourselves, I believe, to be obedient to God. Now, I'm not saying everybody because you got some people that just waiting to come back in to raise hell. We know that. That's human nature. That's okay. God's got them tagged and I will be able to see them as soon as they come in. Be all right. But the question is, if you have this disease of I, that's not kingdom. If you have this disease of self, that's not kingdom. We must, Mount Zion, we must forsake anything, any arrogancy in the church. We must forsake, we must put down anything that's not of God. Look at yourself. Don't look at nobody else. Look at yourself. Look deep within yourself. And if you have a bit of an attitude that you think you want to be forefront, a bit of an attitude that you think is all about you, I beg you to ask God to remove it. Quick, fast, and in a hurry. Because nobody knows when they're leaving out of here. We don't know when God is going to start to expose but when he do, there's nobody that can pray over you to stop what God is going to do. When he does, there's no amount of oil that we can pour over you to stop what God is going to do. He's going to do what he's going to do until the end. And our prayer and his hope is that when he's finished and he hasn't taken you out, that you will get new life inside of you. There's a chance. We have a chance, Mount Zion. Anybody here, anybody on the conference call line, 
anybody that's viewing live on the stream, if there's a part of you that you feel has a deotrophist spirit, we will lift a prayer. Because deotrophist spirit has no place in the kingdom of God. This deotrophist spirit has no place in the child of God. What would it be like if Charlene had this type of spirit in her and her daughters are watching her? What would they see that mom thinks is all about her? Everything is just about mom. She's not doing for nobody. She had that spirit of diotrophism. She doesn't have it. I just used it because I looked back there and I saw Charlene. She doesn't have it. She just said, amen. You know I don't have that, Pastor. Hopefully she got that cake. She was, if she don't have that cake, she was willing to make, uh, she's the ultra fits all over. But, <laughs> but what would it look like, parents, if your children saw a deotrophist spirit in you? What would it look like, Sherma, if your daughter saw diotrophists all in you? You don't care about nobody but Sherma. Get your own food. <laughs> Do for yourself. The, your children will be damaged by this spirit. And if you can see it that the damage will take place on your children, what do you think happens in the church when we have this diotrophist spirit about us? When it's all about us, I don't want to deal with nobody. It's all about me. I must be first. I must be on the front line. I must be this. I must be that. Mount Zion need to close his doors. I'm not there. That spirit of conceitedness cannot reign in God's house. That spirit of I cannot, cannot last, should not last in God's house. We are here because God brought us together. We are here to do the work of Jesus, to do the work that he has commanded us to do. He says to go out to the uttermost parts of the earth. That means there's you, when you go out, you've got to take something with you. You take the word of God. You take the love of God to those people that need it the most. Jesus said, and as much as you've done it to the least of these, You've done it to me. When did we see you hungry? Every time you see somebody hungry, you see Jesus hungry. When did we see you naked? Every time you see somebody naked, you see Jesus naked. When did we see you in prison? Every time you see somebody locked up, and not always in the physical sense. Some of us sitting here are in bondage on other areas of our lives. We're in prison. So true. And sometimes we're imprisoned by somebody else. I can't move without him. Can't live without him. Crazy talk. You'll never hear me say I can't live without Karen. As much as I love her. I am foolish enough to think that my whole life being and my existence revolves around Karen. Because I know minds don't. I know it's tough for her to say. That her existence don't revolve around me. But I know it doesn't. We, we exist because God is allowing us to exist. And so we must work the work of he who has sent us and not we of ourselves. If you have any bit of this eye disease, the CDC can't do nothing about it. The World Health Organization can't do nothing about it. The hospital can't do nothing about it. Your doctor, I don't care how many times you go to the doctor, he will never be able to diagnose this disease. This is a spiritual thing. Can't give you no medicine for this. I don't care how many times he tells you not to eat this and eat at this, it doesn't, it's not going to work. The only way you can get rid of this, dioth, this diotrophist disease this disastrous, dreaded disease of I is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the only way that can get rid of this disease from you. You can't even see the disease on your physical being. So there's no creams you can put on it to make it go away. 
You can't put no alcohol on this, no hydrogen peroxide on this thing. You can't go to grandma and say, grandma, give me some of those old solutions you used to do back in the day. Grandma would tell you, baby, there's nothing I can do to help you on this one. All I can do is pray. That's it. This dreaded disease of I. No place in the kingdom. No place in the church. And it should be no place in a child of God's life. You can't walk right thinking about it, it's all about you. You can't talk right. You can't live right if you have this dreaded disease. And I've come to tell you, every one of us have had it, may have it, a little bit, not all. But there was a time it was all about us. There was a time we were in our feelings and there was nothing nobody can do about it. There was a time everybody was against us and nobody was for us. But it was through Jesus Christ that we were delivered. Thank you, Lord. It was through the blood of Jesus, the anointing blood of Jesus, that we were delivered. And that's the only way you can be delivered on today from this dreaded, disastrous disease of I, this diotrophous disease. Because when you go and you continue to read in third John, in third John you'll, you'll hear about a man named Gaius, and then you'll hear about a man named Demetrius. And when he talk about Demetrius, Demetrius did, ev did everything opposite of Diotrephus. Demetrius was the one that accepted people into the kingdom. Gaius was the one that treated everybody right. But in the middle of that sandwich stood Diotrephus. The outside of the sandwich was the good and the behavior, but right in the middle was the self-serving behavior of Diotrephus. And what God wants us to see, that for every bad apple, you've got two. Because remember when the devil went from heaven, he took one-third of the angels. Two-third remained. Gaius on the one side, Demetrius on the other and the ultrafus in the middle. So when you bring good and they can squash the bad. So be on the side of good, Mount Zion. So we could be the ones that can squash what the devil is trying to do. Even though, even though God has set us up, the devil is still trying to destroy Mount Zion. Even though God has blessed us immensely and he's about to bless us some more. The devil is trying to trip us up, Mount Zion. Keep our focus where it's supposed to be. And the diotrophus will not gain a stronghold in this place. He will not gain a stronghold in this branch of Zion. But if we miss what God is trying to do, that diotrophus spirit will reign supreme. It will become a stronghold a strong man in our lives. Gaius on one side, Demetrius on the other, and in the middle is Diotrephus. Good, bad, one, two. And although I went to school in the hood, two is always greater than one. No matter how you shake it, two is always greater than one. When you go through, remember, whatever the devil does, God got two to rescue you. Hallelujah. He can't beat you because God got angels, too, coming to your rescue. So if there's anybody that knows that they are struggling with that spirit of diatrophus, we just want to say a prayer. And if you know you've been delivered, you ought to be saying thank you, God, for your deliverance.